everyone. Uh, thanks uh, to Oxford Nanopore for giving me a chance to speak about uh, um, this uh, research we did uh, at U of T. Again, this was, this was kind of cool. It was sort of like a, a little side project that turned into a, a nice proof of concept. Um, and, and so I'm just going to share with you a bit about it. So pharmacogenomics is sort of a pivotal part of personalized genomics. It's the study of how genetic factors influence inter-individual variability in drug response. And the beauty with pharmacogenomics is you can actually do this personalized medicine on anybody, healthy individuals in particular, because it's not something you would look for after someone's already sick. You're not trying to figure out something once you've already diagnosed a disease. This is actually something you can do ahead of time, maybe at birth, and then you would actually know how to treat someone or what dose to give them when they go to the doctor and something uh, the doctor could use in their office. So um, before I get into this, um, classical example, uh, as you may have noticed, for example, like last night, there's differential response to alcohol when consumed. And part of that <laughs> can be attributed to how much you drink, but also part of it's attributed to variants in alcohol dehydrogenase. Some individuals get red in the face and they can't metabolize it as quickly. And the same thing is observed in general in, in, in all drugs. So um, drugs typically are metabolized by cytochrome P450 family uh, enzymes. A uh, majority of them, so this, this is a pie chart over here that I borrowed that shows the, the fraction of uh, FDA drugs metabolized by P450 uh, isoforms and the various factors that affect the variability of that metabolism response. So uh, over here at the top, you see CYP3A4. Uh, which metabolizes the most drugs. So chances are if you're taking a drug, it's going to be metabolized by CYP3A4. And essentially what that means is it might be activated or inactivated and then cleared subsequently. Uh, for example, many individuals go to the pharmacy, they take a medication, and then you're told not to eat grapefruit um, while taking this medication. That's because grapefruit has a compound in it that's metabolized by CYP3A4 and it creates a bottleneck. And so it'll actually inhibit CYP3A4, and you might end up with an overdose of the drug that you're currently uh, taking because a physician or a pharmacist is expecting it to be uh, metabolized and then subsequently cleared and, and, and reduce toxicity in a certain time frame. Um, but CYP3A4 is not really affected so much uh, in the population in terms of uh, po by polymorphisms. Um, now, the genes that are particularly important, another, another gene that, that's very important for metabolizing drugs is CYP2D6, metabolizes here about, sorry, 20%, uh, and it's, it's uh, highly polymorphic. There's many different metabolizer classes in the, in the general population, uh, and they can actually affect uh, how you metabolize drugs quite drastically, sometimes faster and sometimes slower than normal. Um, and there's a couple others that are in, of particular interest, uh, CYP2C19, CYP2C9, and there are some other, uh, uh, sorry, some other um, enzymes as well uh, that aren't CYP uh, uh, P450 enzymes that are important for metabolizing drugs. I'll get into a couple in a second. Um, so uh, at, at U of T, uh, during my postdoc, most of what I actually focused on was preparing these types of reports, extracting information, and preparing these pharmacogenomic reports for referring physicians so they can figure out how much of a particular drug, what dose to give a patient uh, so that you know, you're not giving them an overdose, you're, you're trying to target it directly and you know, little red flags might appear, things where you have to watch out, things you should avoid. So these were, this is actually produced by someone at SickKids. I think it's far more developed right now. Um, and essentially these reports would go to the referring physician um, who could then you know, go downstream and, and, and study this. But uh, individuals who are getting these types of reports typically have gone through what we call the, the genome clinic arm of the hospital. So those people were already being sequenced and they're trying to implement a pipeline. So I thought, you know, it could be something we could explore with alternate modes of, of sequencing. So before I get into that, when you're looking at these pharmacogenomic variants, um, one thing to be aware of is, is haplotypes. And many of you might be familiar with it. It's haploid genotype. And essentially what it is, is it's a set of, of, of tightly linked genetic markers that are present on one chromosome and are inherited together. And as humans, we're diploid. We have two copies of every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. Um, and there's a certain set of haplotypes that just exist in the general population. And so you could have two copies of one. You could be totally normal, homozygous. You could be heterozygous. Uh, so for example, in this little figure I grabbed over here, here's a population of individuals. And you can see over here, there's three, low, three, three SNPs we're interested in and they make up individual haplotypes. And so you can see there's three haplotypes in this population, um, and the, the, the red uh, v variants over here 
are linked. So for example, if I had a G, I would be expecting a T and an A in that particular haplotype. So these things would be linked. So uh, an, Im an important example, this one I like to give because this is where pharmacogenomic or clinical haplotypes are, are super critical, especially in, 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 in treatment of children with leukemia. So uh, mercaptopurine is a drug you would use to treat uh, leukemia, IBS, uh, I think a couple others. Um, and dosing of it is, inc is incredibly important in terms of the precise dose that's, that's administered. So mercaptopurine um, is, uh, outcompetes purine and interferes with synthesis of RNA and DNA and, and functions there. And it's, uh, as a thiopurine or mercaptopurine over here, are actually metabolized, inactivated by TPMT, thiopurine methyltransferase. And this enzyme is polymorphic in the population and has a couple different metabolizer classes. One of them is called the extensive metabolizer. This is basically, extensive metabolism means you're breaking down the drug, and so this means that you're basically having the normal response. And, and you would start off with like, you know, a certain dose, whatever the, the doctors have decided is appropriate, and it would break down over a certain predictable time course. Um, another type of metabolizer class, based on mutations in TPMT, is called the intermediate metabolizer. And you would just basically get moderate to high concentrations of these active metabolites. So you'd reduce the dose. And finally, the poor metabolizer class is basically individuals who can't metabolize the drug and, and inactivate it. And so they end up with extremely high concentrations of these active metabolites in their system, which can lead to actually fatal toxicity without a dose decrease. So here's an example of why this gets a little bit complicated and why haplotype phase is very important uh, when you're looking at TPMT for dosing this. So here I'm showing you four haplotypes. Star one is normal. I apologize for these, these names. They're kind of bad. Uh, I met a guy at a conference, and he had a, t a poster titled Star Wars because he hates these names so much. He's trying to rename it. But star one basically represents a series of markers in a, in a given haplotype. And these are the two markers I'm going to focus on. So you can see T and C here are reference. And this is essentially what I'm going to draw as. This is your piece of DNA. I think this is 40 kV, let's say. Um, these might be uh, like 10 kV apart, I, I think, something like that. Um, and in this case, they're both referenced. This is a normal metabolizer. So this would be extensive. Then you have these three over here called star three. And all of these will have a lower uh, rate of metabolism for TPMT. Now, since you're going to be diploid, you're going to have two copies. You're going to have star, maybe star one and star one, maybe star three and star one. You're going to get two copies of these. And that can affect your metabolism status. Now, problems arise when you're trying to figure out what your specific haplotype is in this gene because the two markers can actually segregate like this. So if you have both markers present, and you're just looking at you know, sequence data in a VCF file, and you see that this individual is heterozygous for marker one and heterozygous for marker two, that could mean two possible diplotypes for this individual. You could have star one and star three, where the markers are on the same strands. So you have those two haplotypes. Or you could have this uh, genotype over here. You've got one on 3B and one on 3C. But in this case, here you would be an intermediate metabolizer, and here you would be uh, a poor metabolizer. And that's important because it affects dose greatly. So if you're normal, you would get 100% of the normal dose. If you're intermediate, you get a 30 to 70% reduction. However, if you're, if you're a poor metabolizer, you're actually going to get a 90% reduction. And so you know, a physician might try to be, play it safe and say, OK, I'm going to give everyone a 90% reduction. But individuals who are normal are just going to break this drug down right away, and you're going to get disease pro pro uh, progression or worsening of, of leukemia symptoms. And there's lost time in adjusting that dose. Alternatively, if you say, OK, I'm going to give everyone the normal dose, you can have uh, a lethal dose. So it's extremely important that these tests are done. And in children, especially in a hospital for sick children where we, we did this research, they don't give this drug to anyone without actually doing this, this test first. Um, here's an example where they used 23andMe uh, um, genotyping, and it actually predicted something incorrect because they weren't phased. But this individual was predicted to be a star 3, star 3, which is extremely, extremely rare in the, in the population. Um, so they went backwards and looked at the pedigree, which you can usually use to figure out the correct haplotype or diplotype for an individual. So these are his parents. And over here, you can see he's actually a star 1, 3A instead of 3B, 3C. So in the absence of a pedigree, you would use population-based statistical haplotype phasing. Um, popular tool is Beagle, and that's something I used. I'm going to give you one more example just to, because I think this one is, is, is kind of cool as well. So CYP2D6, like I mentioned, is a really important enzyme for breaking down drugs. 
And one drug, uh, analgesic, uh, is codeine. Many of you will be familiar with it. Uh, you, you go to the dentist, you get some, some work done, and, and they prescribe you a painkiller. Now, codeine on its own doesn't actually have an effect. It's a pro-drug. In order for it to have a painkiller effect, it's actually metabolized by CYP2D6 into morphine. Now, remember how I said CYP2D6 can have four possible metabolizer classes. Extensive is normal, intermediate is sort of in between, poor is low, but you can also have this ultra-rapid metabolizer. So for example, I go to the dentist, I get the codeine, I take it and I get basically no pain relief. That means I'm probably an intermediate or poor metabolizer. My body is not taking that pro-drug and converting it into morphine, and so I'm not getting that, that painkiller effect. However, you can also end up with this ultra-rapid phenotype where an individual will take codeine and break it down into tons of morphine and then basically get a morphine overdose and possibly die or, or have you know, repressed uh, breathing. And you, you hear about these sometimes, these scary cases in the news about a mother who's breastfeeding and the infant dies because one of them was, had a different metabolizer class than the other and the mother was taking a particular drug, sometimes something like codeine. So at sick kids, for example, they don't even prescribe codeine to children. They go straight to, to morphine just to avoid this kind of possible overdose effect. Um, so basically, knowing these, these, uh, these metabolizer classes is really important, and knowing them ahead of time, before you actually go to a hospital or a doctor, is really critical. So here's the current workflow we were using. Uh, we had data coming in from a bunch of different sources. We had sequinome mass array. We had a whole bunch of whole exome sources. We had some complete genomics, whole genomes. We called variants. Then we passed them into Beagle. We do statistical phasing, which basically uses population-based data to try to figure out what the most likely haplotype is, or diplotype is, uh, and then we would annotate them and then convert them to this awkward sort of star nomenclature that physicians can, can use, and it gets put into a report. And we piloted this, and it's basically taking off right now. Um, so we thought, okay, well, can we use nanopores here? And there's a, a couple cool things that nanopores afford you uh, in, in terms of a, a whole bunch of factors of, of price, uh, speed, and all of them actually play a role in pharmacogenomic testing. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to address a bunch of them, and, and actually I think our project was kind of cool because it, it was sort of unique in that it used every aspect of what's amazing about nanopore sequencing. So first of all, there's no upfront cost to purchase one of those massive million dollar sequencers or whatever they cost now, uh, and that's, that's quite expensive for some of these smaller hospitals that might need results you know, within a week within a, a few days, and they don't want to actually have to go and buy an Illumina sequencer or, or something comparable. Um, the sequencing is done in real time, and it's done very rapidly, and sometimes these decisions need to be made pretty quickly, so that's another benefit. Um, accuracy, I, I know uh, there are certain error rates that, that can affect how well things align, but by having these ultra-long reads, and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much depth over this, it just happens to be that our gene here, CYP2D6, has a gene very close next to it that's a paralog that's 99% similar called CYP2D7. And if you're trying to properly classify individual SNPs in 2D6, you're going to have to make sure you're not sequencing 2D7. And since they're so similar and so close, you can use PCR tricks, try to avoid it, but you also want to make sure later on that you're not accidentally sequencing it. With Illumina reads, typically they're short enough that you'll actually map to both. Um, with, uh, I'll just, you know, spoiler alert, nanopores basically are able to distinguish between the two when aligning, which is very encouraging because the reads basically sp span the entire gene. And finally, the most important part is this nanopore sequencing gives you single molecule sequencing and long reads. And so you have these reads that can span your entire gene and they're representative of a single molecule. And what that means is that you'll be able to read haplotypes straight off a single read, provided you don't encounter errors. Um, this was our setup. Uh, we're a computational lab. This is all our lab equipment right here. Um, we, can, we had to borrow a couple things from a, a collaborator which was, who was very generous. Um, and I, again, I had some experience in the past. Um, also, always follow your protocols very directly. I used a P200 instead of a P1000, and I splashed the uh, biohazardous stuff in my face the first day I did this. <laughs> and then Dan, uh, he, he saw me at the last conference uh, a while back, and he looked at me, he's like, well, you're here. So everything worked out all right. Uh, and then I found out what was in it and I wasn't happy. Anyway, so, uh, so this is basically our setup. It's very naive. Basically, we just did a PCR amplification uh, of our, of our uh, genes of interest. We used the reference uh, Utah pedigree sample NA12878, which is extremely popular. It's been sequenced to death on every single platform. So we had confidence in what we were looking at so we could you know, compare it. Uh, 
And we looked at three short genes in the first experiment. That's not true. We looked at 10, and then we changed it to three when we saw what yield could be like. And we basically got uh, 2D6, and then we were a little ambitious, and we tried the HLA A and B genes. Um, we didn't go too deep into that because it proves quite difficult, but we did sequence it, and it was very interesting. Um, all right. You guys are familiar with all this stuff. I won't go into it. Uh, we ended up using both LAST and Blazor. I think probably early on, we played around with LAST, and we didn't really know how to adjust the gap penalties so well. So Blazor was a little bit easier to use, and that's what I settled on. But if I were to revisit this, I'd probably explore some of the newer aligners. Um, so this is, this is a R7.3, I believe, uh, or, or yeah, R7.3 data on the MAP003 kit. Um, this is uh, what we published. So over here, you can see our uh, number of read fragments that have been aligned. And over here, the, the fragment length. And you can see this distribution here, and then this, this spike over here, which basically corresponds to HLA, A, and B, which are 4KB in length. Uh, you can see the kind of the peak right at 4KB, and then you get this, this tail end over here, suggesting that there's some sort of fragments that you're losing when you're aligning or possibly shearing during pipetting. Um, and as well, you see the 5KB peak over here for, for SIP2D6, so that was encouraging. Um, substitution frequencies, insertion frequencies were pretty good, I thought. Uh, deletion frequencies, I guess DNA slipping through the pore a little bit too quickly were a little high. Again, if you revisited this now, it would look a little better. Uh, this was a newer uh, kit. This I did maybe uh, two days before I finished up at U of T. So uh, unfortunately, yields were a little low, and we, we couldn't really go too deep into it. But we did get you know, significantly more enrichment, and the read quality was a little bit better. I'm sorry, I don't have the, the stats here. But the read quality was better, and, and this data, again, is, is publicly accessible. So it looks like things are getting better, and that's very encouraging. I, I'm more interested in sort of the, the application, but definitely something very cool. Um, when you have high errors, I guess it helps to have a little bit extra coverage. So uh, I think we had 1,500x coverage of, of one of the HLA uh, genes, because uh, we didn't really know what kind of yield to expect. So we just sequenced basically three genes and some control. Here you can see CYP2D6. Here's your exons and the uh, introns over here. Um, and then the, the colors, this is an IGV. The colors just represent orientation that it was aligned in. These are just 2D reads. Plenty of errors, plenty of insertions. Again, that could be cleaned up with a newer aligner, possibly on a newer kit. Um, but the cool thing here is these are individual reads spanning the entire gene. So if I go through and I'm looking for those variant loci, I can actually go and, and pick them out one by one and figure out what the haplotypes are for each one of these reads and then create proportions of, of each haplotype. So here's an example of the star 4 locus. This is a loss of function allele of CYP2D6. It's an A to G uh, substitution. Uh, at this particular locus, you can see there's a bit of reference, and I kind of showed you, in this case, the, the, uh, the, uh, the star four alleles being picked up on these reads. Now, if you just compress this into some sort of uh, um, um, sort of a coverage plot over here of each of the alleles, you can see that star four, and uh, this is the reference over here, and this is the star four allele, and you see this spike over here, which would basically represent a heterozygous call. It's not perfect. The ratios are a bit off, probably attribu attributable partially to our PCR amplification step. Um, but, but this was pretty interesting because there weren't actually that many spikes in the sequence when it wasn't a heterozygous call. And again, we, we know, I should, I should step back, we know that uh, NA12878 is a star 3, star 4 diplotype. Sorry, I should have clarified that. So for the most part, we actually observed most chromosomal positions with the 70 to 90 percent consensus. So I mean, if I just read right off the top over here, I'd be able to get the consensus sequence for most calls, unless they were HET calls. Um, now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in the absence of, of um, things that are phased structurally, in other words, I have a read that spans both loci, you can do statistical phasing. Um, and so we used uh, Beagle uh, uh, to do this. But there are limitations to st statistical phasing. So if you have a, a, a novel haplotype or a rare haplotype that's not represented in the, in the population that your model was trained on, you're going to miss it completely. And so that's one of the benefits of using this direct haplotype reading. Um, especially clinically, it's very useful. Um, and like I said, you don't need to do suppl supplemental phasing. Um, and so we said, can we, can we detect these using single molecule long reads? So I'm showing you we're able to see that star 4 het call, but can we actually detect haplotypes? Can we differentiate between that star 3 and star 4 that we know exist? And we can. It's a little bit messy. So if we actually looked at the alleles, the, the, the markers responsible for star 3 and star 4, their individual uh, regions, in this case just one, uh, you can see that, uh, not in this figure, you'd be able to see that star 3 and star 4 make up exactly half of the 
reads. So it looks like a perfect uh, heterozygous compound het uh, lower metabolizer uh, phenotype for CYP2D6. Uh, unfortunately, we, we got a lot of unclassified noise uh, due to error rates, which again can be fixed in, in, in more advances in the technology. And STAR2 basically represents reference, which means that it's possible we we're reading template switching or there was some contamination. Uh, it's basically the first half of star three and the second half of star four, and that basically gives you a star two. So that's the importance of haplotypes. On their own, if you took these variants and you phased it with Beagle, it would tell you star three, star four. But if you try to dig a little deeper and actually get the, the, the haplotype straight out of it, you'd be able to see you're looking, at, you're, you're looking at a star two, star three, and a star four. And the encouraging thing is here that if you were to hand this to a doctor, it's, it's not really clear. It looks like there's four possible categories. But if all of them were normal metabolizers, a physician could say, I'm not seeing anything rare. I'm not going to adjust the dose. But if you saw star 3 and star 4, you'd say, OK, it's possible this individual has a, a, a homozygous uh, poor metabolizer phenotype for CYP2D6. And therefore, I'm going to adjust their dose of codeine, for example. Or I won't give them codeine at all. Um, and again, this is confirmed using Beagle, uh, which is based on 1,000 genomes data. Um, perhaps I'll gloss over this a bit. HLA, A, and B. Uh, highly polymorphic regions. We managed to sequence them. Um, it's a little bit tricky to do uh, after you're done that to find out the exact type. And again, I'm not an expert in this. Many other people are. Um, but we were able to sequence it as a proof of principle. And the reads span the entire HLA locus. We had trouble typing it. But we were able to go over to the HAP map and confirm that we're observing the proper diplotypes. So for HLA-A, 30% of the reads represented the parental haplotype. This, one, this individual is homozygous for a particular haplotype. So both parents have the same one. This individual had 30%. And if you just include one mismatch you were getting in those markers, you're getting about 85% representing that haplotype, which is that diplotype, which is very encouraging. So you're basically observing things without statistical phasing. For HLIB, it was a little bit trickier. Half of it represented a transmitted haplotype. And then we got a bit over here of the other transmitted haplotype, but some noise. And again, these are notoriously hard regions to sequence. So being able to do this in single reads was pretty exciting. But unfortunately, we couldn't get the, the four-digit typing to work uh, with the error rates we had. And also, a lot of the tools that are out there aren't really uh, used to reads that are so large. Um, but anyways, it's, it's very encouraging. And in next gens, or with newer aligners, we could probably get these uh, unclassified regions to shrink and also figure out what's going on with these uh, extra uh, untransmitted haplotypes that we're observing. Uh, so to summarize, obviously you know it's error prone in its current stage, but it works. And this is something we're very excited about. Um, we kind of envisioned it as a lab could buy a kit that has the primers of interest, or maybe a capture kit, for multiplexing 10 individuals on an individual sequencer. It would cost them next to nothing, and they could get their results in no time in a hospital that's maybe far away from a uh, high throughput expensive tabletop sequencer. Um, we got uh, accurate alignment for paralogs. That SIP 2D6, 2D7, there's actually a 2D8 down there. We got everything aligning accurately to 2D6, which was very cool. Even with the error rates that we had, um, because the reads were so long, they just spanned enough variation that it was uh, accurately mapped. And uh, we also expect that as the guidelines increase, these uh, uh, clinical uh, pharmacogenomics implementation gui uh, consortium guidelines called CPIC. Um, basically, they're the, the expert opinion on how these uh, uh, pharmacogenomic recommendations are coming out. As those expand, we expect that this will play a much larger role in the clinic. Uh, probably people will have this as part of their genome sequence from birth, uh, a report that your physician gets so they know what kind of drugs to prescribe to you, what kind to avoid. And I think this would definitely help it through uh, to that stage. Um, all right, so uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my uh, supervisors, Gary Bader and Mike Brudno, as well as the, the team that helped put this together. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, last minute show up at their office and they, they just kind of helped get me some sequence. Uh, and finally, the, the Sick Kids Pharmacogenomics Clinic team. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Uh, can we take some questions? It's on. Hello? Um, the, the way you get the reference um, coming through that shouldn't have been there, do you think that's alignment bias or do you think it's a fusion PCR product where you're fusing the two different other alleles? We explored a couple uh, alternatives like template switching where sometimes the, the polymerase can fall off and go back on. But I did a whole bunch of checks. I think it's possible contamination. Um, it could be due to the high error rates. Again, we did observe a 50-50 distribution of star 3 and star 4. But if you just kind of swap over to the other strand, 
it'll look like a star two. So if you took the alleles and just did variant calling and passed it into Beagle, you would get a star three, star four diplotype. But if you just read along the strands, there's something weird going on. So I'm not sure how to answer that right now, but I think probably something during the PCR could have, could have caused it. Over here. Hi. Um, just a question of scale. Uh, what's the longest distance between SNPs that you were able to haplotype in a single read? We, we didn't explore outside of these genes, but for example, uh, there are some long-range PCR protocols that I've seen that can do bracket one or two, like an 80 KB amplicon, which Nanopore is technically capable of doing. You probably shear it to pieces while pipetting, but with a steady hand, maybe you could get something good. Uh, with TPMT, I think the two markers are 8 KB apart, um, but that's not really a problem here because these reads basically span the entire amplicon. We had some fragments down at the bottom. I mean, it's 1200X coverage, but for the most part, most of our reads span the entire thing. So you could probably do it, whatever the limits of the nanopore sequencer would be, would be uh, within accuracy, you'd be able to, to scale to that, that distance of markers. Okay, thank you.